Oh, what are we doing the now? On that side, twist it and pin it. We can in hairstyles. Pin it on the second side, create your first twist right next to your part, pin it in place, and then do the same thing right underneath it. I have to twist Couple them first. Small pieces around the face, and then on one side, sweep all of that hair back. And you're going to pin it right below where the twists are that we've just pinned. She just knows what's happening back there. And finally, you're going to do the same thing on the other side. Just grab all the hair that's left over your ear and pin it back. And that's it for Marjorie's half up do. You can see we got a lot of volume by stacking that hair up really Good. high. And taking off of the center part, go ahead and grab a section. And now onto Cersei's twisted half up do. And grab a section right next to your part, leaving a few. Is this real hair? Then no, take right? of the rope braids back behind your head and wrap them around each other for a few inches. Once Ooh. you've done that, go ahead and secure it with an elastic. Nice. Someone gave me this Next, kind of, grab a section of hair right elastics. Below your rope braid and twist it back away from the face just a couple of times. Look at this yellow hair. Thing on the other side. Rope braid. This creates three sections which you can now use to braid all the <gasps> Nice! I like this it. this recreates one of Cersei's really popular hairstyles, but it's a little bit easier because she originally had a five-strand braid in there, and I just don't even have time for that, guys. So, three-strand braid it all the way down and secure it with an elastic, and of course, you can loosen it up if you want to. No time. I feel ya. Whether you're doing this as a costume or not, I encourage you to try this hairstyle because it is beautiful, it is bohemian, and it comes together surprisingly. You have to have like long hair for that, you loves. If you have very short hair, forget about it. Now it's not as cute. It has to cover your boobs. Pick up a section of hair from your crown to your temples and put that into a high, high ponytail. Yeah, no, ponytail. it's fake hair. I get it. To make her twist, I cheated a little bit. I bought two bun makers from the dollar store. Cut each of them and then bobby pin them together, and that makes the form that you can then create your twist with. To make the twist, bring all of your hair forward from that ponytail and drape it over the twist maker, and then fan it out so you can cover as much of it as you possibly can. Don't stress if you don't get all of it, because when we twist the hair, it's going to cover some more. Then you want to bobby pin your hair to the twist maker, that way we can just roll the hair up really, really easily. So make sure wow. you pin as much hair as you can to that twist maker. This is so complex. Now you just gotta roll this thing up like a sleeping bag or a yoga mat <laughs> until you've got all the hair twisted around your twist maker. Wow. Now just tack it down by pinning once in the center and once on either side of the twist maker so that it is now laying nicely against your Okay. Head. Now just use your hands to gently slide the hair around until you have hair covering all of the twist maker and it just looks like this magic twist that you have made on top of your head. Once you've done that, you can pin it a few more times if you want to. That's... Now we've just got to do some rope braids. Grab a small section of hair right next to one side of your twist and rope braid that. And then, then do the same thing on the other side so you have two small rope braids. How do now you I'm keep take them? one along the back to hide my hair elastic. And I'm just pinning that as I go. And then I decided to loop it around one more time to hide the part in my hair. These are great because you can just kind of use them to hide whatever. And then I took the second rope braid and I just draped it across the front where my head hit the twist and bobby pinned as I went. Finish this off either by leaving the rest of your hair down or by making two rope braided pigtails on either side of your head. Cute. I like it. And that's it for it. Sansa's updo. This is one legit costume hairstyle. If you can pull this off, you will definitely get noticed for your awesome hair. Beautiful. It's nice. Last but not least, we've got Daenerys braids. Never least. Okay, show We're me. going to make four braids. Start with the section right next to your part. Leave a couple pieces out around your face and then braid that all the way down. Then create the same the braid way. on the other side. Remember to leave your little pieces out as that is a very signature part of this hairstyle. Now take the remaining hair between your braid and your ear, leave some pieces out and then braid that section all the way down and repeat that on the other side. Now let's pull it all together. We're just gonna grab those two top braids and pull them to the back of your head. And go ahead and secure them with an elastic I need just that about thing. the middle of your head. Then wrap a small piece of hair around the elastic and pin it in place. Now grab those final two braids and pull them to the back of the head as well. It's grab nice. Grab the tail from our first two braids, incorporate that with everything else and secure it with an elastic. This should be pretty low, close to the nape of your neck. Now just wrap a piece of hair around that very last bit, pin it, and you are done. 
have to paint it? I'm not gonna lie, this hairstyle made me feel like a real life warrior. I loved it. It's another one of those that I would wear every day, not just for costume. Yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed seeing how these hairstyles came together, and I hope you end up wearing some. I enjoy your look in there. Day or for Halloween. And that's it for this video. I hope you Good times. It. I want to see more of your stuff. More hairstyles. For more hairstyles. 1.8 million subscribers, you guys. Like, no joke. But everything else is boring, no? I'm coming out. Where are we coming out to? And just generally, my way of silencing myself was to be like, okay, this goes in the background of your brain. And was like, it's fine, it's fine. Like, I, I'm by Oh, it melted away. Some kind of like unnecessary spicy high with girls until the walls came down. Okay. And for the first time, I like stretched my arms. Self therapy, I feel you. I do these things as well. Um. We're gonna see this one recommended by Olga, also this little nagging thought in the back of my head since basically the beginning of time that game of thrones is one of the most historically accurate pieces of television media ever produced today and it isn't even set in a period along our timeline of reality here is what i mean by that <laughs> this needs to not happen for the whole video <laughs> now we're gonna keep her handy we might need her later what even is historical accuracy to begin with first and foremost the whole concept of historical accuracy is basically just fantasy in and of itself because we only effectively have select bits and pieces of information surviving to us through time with which we can sort of piece together a rough understanding of how things were in the past but because history is a progression a sort of practical agriculture is going to in Winterfell, which is one of the northernmost kingdoms on the continent of Westeros. It is cold, it is rugged, winter is coming, and these are the people who get hit hardest by that, so they have to be practical. Agriculture is going to be slightly more difficult in this region from what we can see of the surrounding landscape, so any agricultural focus is probably most likely placed on food crops over textile crops and as a result we see characters in this region responding appropriately to this by dressing in wools leathers and furs materials that are animal based and thus easier to obtain whether through the raising of livestock or through hunting the wolves and rabbits and sundry such furry things that would be populating the surrounding landscape. We actually get a really interesting sense of the distribution of dye materials as well that are available in different regions. Dorne, for example, has particular access to some sort of saffron bright yellow dye that many of the other kingdoms don't seem to have as much ready access to. There seems to be a readily available supply of black dye up in the north where the Night's Watch have deemed it both reasonable and feasible to dye everyone's clothing black despite being on a very limited budget. The Reach and High Garden have access to more rich blues and greens and King's Landing sees all the boldest and brightest colors of southern Westeros due to its centrality of significant trade routes between Essos and the kingdoms of Westeros. And there is real impressive attention paid to this material accessibility throughout the series. I'm see a visible impressed by your knowledge of color geography. And variety by the end of the series, most notably, of course, in King's Landing, where years of ongoing war has likely disrupted these trade routes meaning that this highly urban center, which doesn't have great agricultural capacity to begin with, especially not once it's shut its walls to the outside world, no longer has access to the great variety of material and dyes that it once did. Dyes would be used sparingly or diluted, resulting in a significantly more muted color palette, which we absolutely see. Back again, though, to textile fibers, we seem to be working with the same natural fibers that we have access to in reality. Linens, cottons, wools, silks, leathers, furs, hemp and grass, and metals. Purely, of course, due to the practical limitation of us not just being able to invent new textile fibers to make clothing out of. So it makes sense that these silks and cottons are produced in the hotter regions of Dorne, 
pentose, and carb, and that these materials are in most cases woven to be extremely light and diaphanous to suit these climates. Contrast that with the Riverlands, for example, where we still see what appears to be silk, but woven in heavier damasks and brocades to suit these cooler climates. High Garden also seem to be very fond of brocades, but their garments are, again, adapted for these warmer climates by being cut for less coverage. Then, of course, there is the interesting case of the Dothraki, who are largely nomadic and so have to rely on materials that can be hunted or gathered from their surroundings. And we see this thought out so brilliantly in the clothes that we do see them in. Leather looks like a wonderfully not time-consuming way to add texture to a large expanse of a garment. There is also the question of who is making these clothes. There are several lines throughout the series in which it's made clear that the Starks are making their own clothing. I like your dress. Who made it for you? I, I made it myself. At least Sansa, Arya, and Catelyn are. I don't know about the boys. Presumably they at least have an armorer taking care of the arming gear that they are seen most prevalently in. But this begs the realization that the real commodity in garment quality then is time. Characters of nobility like the Starks, who presumably have more free time to spend on garment making, are presumably going to have more finely made garments than the people who need to balance sewing with work or trade for ready-made garments. Characters in King's Very Landing, well at least the royalty, as we see in this one scene with Joffrey and his tailor, are having dedicated dressmakers and tailors making their garments for them. Which again probably adds to the ability for King's Landing garments to be more elaborately seamed and decorated than the Northerners' garments. The principle of period imperfection is also something we see reflected on screen here, and it brings me so much joy. This is basically the idea that before industrialized standardization, and possibly even before the standardization of measurements, things crafted by real human hands are not always going to be rigidly perfect and precisely measured. We see, for example, some slight variation in the spacing of the eyelets on Igret's shoulder strap, which serves to make this look more like something that was made in the middle of a frozen wilderness. Very cool like a belt purchased from a shop and repurposed for costume reasons. As a result of the immense labor required in producing these garments, we see a good amount of outfit repeating throughout the series, which I always love to see. There is nothing more unrealistic than characters showing up in entirely new garments in every episode, right? because that's not even how we work nowadays, let alone in the days before sewing machines and fast fashion. Sure, the characters of higher classes change clothes more frequently because, yes, ultimately they do have expendable gold to put towards having more clothing made, but garments are at least worn for a few episodes, if not entire seasons, or basically their entire appearance in the show. <laughs> that is section one. Culture. What traditions Good. or regional factors influence what and the ways in which clothing is worn? Once we understand where our materials are coming from and how the clothes are made, we next need to think about the cultural and traditional contexts in which they are worn. One of the most interesting examples of this regional tradition reflected in the clothing, I think can be seen in Karth. Is this it? Yeah, which is the extremely wealthy south coast city of Essos and is really the only place in which we see these elaborate metal filigreed accessories. To me, this cool suggests accessories. a perpetuation of a highly specialized metalworking tradition, which has presumably been carried on by select artisans exclusively in this region geographical region and what materials people might have ready access to. The fire god priestesses, for example, seem to be required to wear fitted red silk gowns, which might not be an issue for those practicing in the silk producing cities of Essos. One of the biggest examples of sartorial tradition we can find though is in uniform. Who is in uniform? Who isn't? And what does that uniform signify? In King's Landing, for example, we have the King's Guard, who are all precisely uniformly dressed. It specifically communicates affiliation with a highly wealthy and influential institution, 
with access to some of the best craftspeople in the known world. On the other hand, we have the Night's Watch, guarding the wall in the north, a separate military faction who, in principle, are in uniform. All the men are required to wear black, presumably also for the very practical need to be able to spot each other on ranges beyond the wall. The Night's Watch is, though, a notoriously underfunded and waning institution, so while a sense of visual unity is striven for amongst the men, the practical expenses of uniform have proved a hindrance. And it looks to me like the men seem to just be dyeing their own clothing black, maintaining the styles and quality of garment whence they came, but just achieving uniform through color. It's interesting then to contrast them with the wildlings living beyond the wall, who aren't in uniform, but they still are fairly uniform looking in palette. The difference though is that whereas the wildlings are all beginning with the same base selection of materials, furs and leathers mostly, <laughs> they're embellishing their clothing all more longer individually spheres. based on additional items like shells or bones that they find and which presumably have personal meaning to them. The Night's Watch begin with identifying garments made from a wide variety of materials, but as a result of the mandates of their uniform, actively remove uniquely identifying features of their clothing, such as color, in an effort to eliminate individualization. <sighs> okay, physical constraints. Good. What motions Good. or movements does a person need to do or does not need to do in these clothes? Long trailing dresses are the norm because no night, but she nevertheless sticks to the movable clothing that she's most comfortable in. No trailing dresses or long sleeves for her, but instead she's opted for a split skirt. These were a clever trick of the 1890s with the rise of cycling, where women needed to at least appear respectively skirted in polite society, but also required the practicality of bifurcated garments to allow for this specific physical activity. Brienne has adopted that same mentality here by appearing, at least, to be skirted like the other ladies at court, but is still, of course, ready to jump on a horse and charge off on a quest at a moment's notice. Class. How does wealth, or lack thereof, influence access to styles or materials, amounts of clothing, off wastage? Especially this particular cut of gown with a smooth, fitted waist and a very flared skirt, those wide gores mean that fewer dress panels can fit along the width of the material, meaning that you need more length. And of course, there's a ton of space just wasted around these slimmer body sections. Characters of lower classes tend to be in much looser fitting garments, held snug with belts or ties at the waist, which utilize, of course, the entire width of fabric at much less yardage. This point about garment cut actually seems to carry more importance than the cost of the materials themselves. For example, when the character Shay comes to King's Landing with Tyrion, she's given a lovely, fine, silk-looking gown, but it's still very loose fitting with no complex curves cut in, presumably in an effort to conserve that costly material as much as possible, while of course still having her look nice enough to be seen in the palace. This is not a phenomenon that we see in the women's wear of Essos. Garments there tend to be more loosely cut, with the exception of some of the men's tailored robes and coats in wealthy cities like Karth. But I suspect that this is due to the climate constraints, meaning that looser garments are better suited to the heat. Westerosi people need to trade for the expensive silks and brocades, so materials directly equal money. Whereas in Essos, where any silk merchant or weaver could have access to the same fine cloth, it's the intricacy of the craftsmanship, the labor that goes into these clothes, and presumably the amount of items owned that communicate status. This ability to visually delineate social class and wealth also serves to indicate some of the political states in any given region. For example, amongst the northerners of Westeros, the class divide seems much smaller. Everyone seems to be working roughly from the same selection of base materials, and visually there isn't as ostentatious a distinction between the classes as there is in, say, King's Landing, where the people of higher classes have a much wider selection of imported materials to spend money on. The visual class distinction plays a particularly important role in the cities of Slaver's Bay, where not only is the class divide significant, but it literally plays a defining role in the operation of those societies. The enslaved class are fairly visually uniform in color palette, with little access to any dye materials. The garments are loosely fitting and seem, for the most part, to be 
simply draped with very little stitching labor required. The garments are worn in a way that draws the eye to the mandated collar, which points to these garments being strictly regulated with little room for variation or expression. The enslavers, on the other hand, have access to bright dyes and complex ecap patterned fabrics, which is more displayed rather than actually worn in this entirely superfluous method of looping these expensive materials through metal rings rather than draping the fabrics into functional garments. Class is also in many cases the biggest dictator of how many costumes a character can be seen in. The more money they have for clothing, the more clothing they're able to own. And this is adhered to really carefully and respectfully throughout the series. Characters who don't have access to as much time, money, or materials are only seen in the same handful of garments for entire seasons. But even those who do have the means to obtain more clothing still aren't seen unrealistically in an entirely new costume and style in every single episode. This is especially apparent on the men. Even the men of royal and noble classes are wearing repeated costumes due to the very practical, non-disposable nature of armor. Ned Stark even wears the exact same armor in season one as young Ned is wearing in Bran's flashback vision, suggesting that this is a garment that he's been wearing for decades. But even characters like young Sansa Stark in King's Landing and Cersei Lannister and Daenerys, who presumably have the most access to all of the money makers and materials of anyone in Westeros, are still seen in repeated costumes throughout the series because garments do become part of a person's wardrobe, even if that person is only wearing said garment while it's fashionable for a season or two. Trends. Who are the trendsetters? Which brings us to the aspect of fashion itself, the popularity of certain styles and the evolution of trends. Who are the trendsetters? Who follows the trends? And how are these fashionable styles adapted through various social classes and occupations according to individual means? Throughout our own history, fashionable trends have largely been dictated by those possessing some sort of celebrity, be that influencers, models, actors, musicians today, or historically, the royalty, nobility, wealthy, or those who have achieved particularly heroic deeds, who were frequently seen in paintings or reported on either in print or through oral legacy. People in perceived positions of power tend to be the ones who those perceiving the power look to for influence. In the world of Game of Thrones, we have the royalty of Westeros, the noble houses of Westeros, and the wealthy or battle-seasoned of Essos who seem to be leading these trends. And we even see this really cool phenomenon of fossilized court dress reflected in this show, which makes me so happy, and it is absolutely something that happened in real history. This persistence of specific fashions reminiscent of previous decades or centuries worn only within the court setting due to the traditional perception of them. For example, the big wide hoop panniers of the 18th century were so exaggerated for formal court dress and took on such a signification of noble silhouette that we see these hoops worn well into the end of the century when they'd gone out of fashion in normal societal dress and even persisted into the Regency period when they made absolutely no sense with the fashionable waistline of the new dresses, but were still worn because, again, tradition. We absolutely see this happening in King's Landing and I am Absolutely buzzing about it, both during Marjorie Tyrell's wedding to King Joffrey and Sansa Stark's wedding to Tyrion Lannister, we see both women showing up to the Sept in some sort of pannier or structured skirt foundation, which isn't seen in any other normal palace context anywhere else in the series. But in terms of general King's Landing fashions, it seems that the burden has fallen largely on Cersei to influence the trends. The wrapped sort of kimono style gowns that she wears initially in the first series are very quickly adopted by Sansa, who is coming down from the north, and the sort of adopted. burrito dress even Marjorie Tyrell adopts at one point later on in the series. Despite there being a very clear style influence within King's Landing, these royal styles are not adopted by the noble houses throughout the rest of the continent. Each house and region has adopted very distinct styles of their own, and that's not for lack of awareness of the King's Landing fashions, as we can see in Sansa Stark's styling in the first 
first few episodes of season one, despite her living in Winterfell, when the royal family come to visit, she's done her best to adopt the lighter colors of King's Landing and even added a subtle braid to the top of her head in honor of the extremely top-heavy braided styles of the South, while still generally keeping it within the preferred hairstyle of Winterfell, which is generally a braided bun at the back of the head for the women and a loose bun at the back of the head for the men. Sansa Stark stands out within this context because she is purposefully opting for a style that is very much not of her kingdom. When she gets to go to King's Landing, she very quickly adopts the full King's Landing braid styles and fashion styles. We see very direct trend influencing with Daenerys's court, especially okay. as she begins to gain power towards the end of the series. Her growing favor for those wide, structured, very tailored shoulders, which incidentally is a very distinct and opposite departure from the soft and flowing silhouettes she was dressed in by other people earlier on in the show. This can be seen reflected almost identically on Miss Andy, her closest advisor. I would assume Miss Andy is at this point responsible for her own dress decisions given Daenerys's anti-slavery mission could be wrong. It looks a bit though like Daenerys was in turn influenced by the Unsullied who all wear the same silhouette in their uniform and of course have since the day she first encountered them. There is, I have noticed, a growing trend throughout Westeros in the later seasons towards more militaristic aesthetics as the continent of course plummets into a state of total war. And we see this once again in King's Landing and in Cersei especially who moves from metal belts initially to full-on shoulder pull and cage crinoline structures under her skirts. Not necessarily practical for actual battle in any sense, but at least they give off hashtag vibes. The plate armor of Kingsguard Corps and Unsullied Punk, maybe. Daenerys's idea of militaristic empowerment. I think Bravo So might be my favorite example of trend spreading. The clothes in Bravos just generally are so interesting, but the roughs. There is a trend in this city and this city alone, it seems like, from what we can see throughout the series, for at least what look vaguely a bit like ruffs. In actuality, they're these elaborately pleated neckbands, which are just extraordinary craftsmanship. So characters of a wealthier or higher status who have the means to follow this trend more closely are the ones primarily wearing them, of course. But we see some form of neckwear on the majority Very of citizens interesting. of Bravos. Those this of lesser means are still either wrapping their necks in some sort too. of cloth, stock, or cravat style type thing, or are wearing them in loose knots in an effort to at least acknowledge this trend to some extent. Acknowledge. Individual preferences slash character psychology. And then we come to the factor of idiosyncrasy, or little personal wardrobe decisions made on behalf of a character's unique personality and their given circumstances. This is the facet of costume design that tends to get the most focus, sometimes to a fault when the costume design is too individual driven and less consideration is taken of the environmental and surrounding influences. There are endless examples of this idiosyncrasy seen throughout the series Brynden the Blackfish wearing armor made to look like literal scales to represent the trout sigil of how with the practicalities of A, where people are getting the materials, B, how people are making the garments, and C, why they are wearing them in the way that they are. This grounds the clothes in such a level of realism that there's really no reason to believe that these clothes and these people and this entire world couldn't have actually existed at some point. The patterns that exist in history can tell us so much about the human psychology and the practicality of why people wear clothing in the way that they do how clothing and technology evolve over time, what catalysts might have occurred to prompt the adoption or elimination of certain styles or materials, and all of these observations can be translated into fantastical circumstances to create worlds which feel as if they can be pinpointed somewhere in time. Speaking of time, I don't have... Very well done. Good times. Bernadette, is that your real name? Future of the USA. Let's listen and close some pages. They redesigned their website, huh? Kift. Hi, my name is Joni Petrie, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Well, 
today I want to talk about the United States chart just by itself as to what transits, what dashas, what predictive tools I have up my sleeve to see what's going to be happening between now and a year or two from now. So let's pull up the United States of America. This is the chart I use and it works amazing. I have used this chart ever since 9-11 because it clearly states the attack on the United States. And even the pandemic, everything works in this chart. So looking at this chart, it is, it is uh, J July 4th, 1776, 6.30 p.m. in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So most importantly that this chart has is all these planets in Gemini, particularly Mars, Venus, Jupiter, Sun. And Mars being at zero degrees of Gemini is critical and crucial, especially since we know that Mars is going to, Mars in the heavens while it's transiting. Remember, I'm gonna be talking about where the planets are transiting in the sky relative to this chart. So you see, this is actually where all the planets were on that day and time, time and place. But what I start doing is I start looking at where the planets are in the sky, and as they move, we call that transit, transiting planets. They will go in and out of different houses, and as they cross over the birth degrees of the planets, they activate events. So talking about transiting Mars now, where it is in the heavens. It's in Taurus for the most part, while it's going retrograde. But, but it is going to step out of Taurus before it turns retrograde, and it's going to go into Gemini. Therefore, transiting Mars in the heavens is going to transit all the way to one degree of Gemini, which means it's going to be sitting almost exactly on the natal Mars of this chart at zero degrees of Gemini. And this is a huge big deal, okay? So this is a major triggering event. But most of all, it's standing still because Mars is turning retrograde. So it's so much more powerful. The impact of Mars on Mars means there could be some type of attack of some sort. Because looking at the United States chart, Mars rules the fifth, but it also rules the 12th houses. Mars rules Aries and Mars rules Scorpio. And this means it could deal with enemies, rulership of the 12th and the fifth, there's a lot going on here with the transit of Mars. Now, let's go over to some other things that I feel like are imperative. And that is the moon in this chart. It sits at seven degrees of Aquarius. And why do I think that is so imperative? Because coming up here very soon, transiting Saturn is going to be in Aquarius. It already went into Aquarius, but retrograded back in Capricorn. So what does this mean when Saturn nears the moon? It's called Sati Sati. Sati Sati is, well, actually it means seven and a half years. And therefore, it's when Saturn's in the sign before the sign the moon's in. The he used to work of, with uh, Genia Kim mm. to sales and PR for her. So just saying. It's one of the biggest um, Metaslavic designers right now. No. Probably not. But... I always tell my clients, don't go look up Saudi Sati on the internet because they'll scare you to death. And that is not true. I feel like when Saturn comes into the sign of the moon is where it really heats up and gets intense. So I think Saudi Sati is when Saturn is getting close to the moon. And that's pretty much within the year that Saturn conjuncts the moon. And conjunction means it's the same degree, the same sign. So transiting Saturn is coming to the moon. When will it be exact? 
Well, Saturn's going to cross over the natal moon three times because it goes forward, crosses over it, then it goes retrograde, it crosses over it, then going direct for the third time, it'll cross over that degree of seven degrees of Aquarius. When? March 19th is going to be the first start time it's going to start rolling over the moon. The next is September 20th. 2023 and the last one is december 3rd of 2023 so basically the united states is going to be in saudi sati heavy duty um and crossing over the natal moon exactly throughout the year of 2023 what is saudi sati well, Saturn. Saturn is the planet of karma. Saturn is the planet that slows things down. Saturn's the planet that restricts and pulls back. And it's, it's serious. It has a serious nature where things need to change. And the moon being in Aquarius is quite a nice thing because Aquarius is the sign of humanity and caring for others. So this could be that this is a serious time to get things in order and take care of things. Now the moon in this chart sits in the third house. What is the third house? It deals with communications, most of all. Education, communications, learning, traveling, all of these things are third house variables. Uh, for looking at mundane astrology, which is the astrology of the world. It's going to deal with the media and it's going to deal with the travel business, most of all, because that's what the third house is for. So with Saturn being over the moon, traveling might be interrupted somewhat, as well as schooling and education needs to get in order and needs to be fixed. And the communications with mass media, the internet, all of these things are definitely what are going to have to be fixed because we all know that the media has been used for all sorts of propaganda. Some of it's true, some of it's not, and it doesn't even matter what side you're on because uh, whether you're Republican or Democrat, both sides use the media for their advantage, and many times both sides either blow up or exaggerate or actually don't even reveal the truth sometimes. So nobody trusts the media anymore. It's just a fact. Saturn going over the moon here in the third house, things have got to change and be cleaned up so that this is somehow, some way, I, don't, I can't imagine how, but be prevented but this is what's going to take place. And the other thing is looking at this chart because the moon rules cancer, if you'll look to the house that has cancer on it, well, it's the eighth house. And the eighth house deals with big money, government money. It deals with banks, with lending. It deals with other people's money, large amounts of money. So Saturn crossing over the moon as it's the rulership of the eighth house means a big change is coming for banks and industry dealing with money, government money. Absolutely. So that's what I see with this Saudi Sauti. By the way, I went back and, and you know Saturn takes 28 to 30 years to go through the entire zodiac. And the last time that it was in Aquarius crossing over the moon was 1994. I didn't see anything horribly detrimental happen that year. And then the time before that was 1965. During that time, it was the Vietnam War. More troops were being sent to Vietnam. And actually, in 1994, things were starting to heat up over terrorism and things like that. So I take that back because, you know, even before we had the World Trade Centers destroyed in 2001, in the 90s, that's where they first got hit. So this is important. So things like this are always brewing pretty much for the United States. And the Saudi Sauti will not give us a freedom away from these type of things. So I can't help but notice that in the next two years, to be exact, or a year and a half, but two years, Pluto is going to return to where it was. 
during the signing of the Declaration of Independence here. So Pluto return is massive major change. Pluto takes about 244 years to go through all 12 signs of the zodiac. It's our slowest moving planet and it makes a major impact because it is so slow. So look at this. Pluto's about to return in the second house of finances and money. Everything about the financial markets and money has got to change and transform. I believe that cryptocurrency is on its way in. It's going to take a while. And yes, there has to be a lot of regulations about cryptocurrency because I believe businesses will start to exchange money. This is the future. This is not the way Bitcoin's been going where people hoard it like gold. No, it's a functioning cryptocurrency that I think eventually will take over in terms of money once it's able to be monetized and regulated this will be the the distant future we won't have dollar bills anymore we hardly do right now because of credit cards so it's all going to change with the pluto return concerning the financial markets money and what we value especially what we value with pluto being there in the second house and it returns pluto represents major major transformations it's also deals with power and it can't even deal with nuclear power so we have to be careful about what's going on with nuclear energy these days yes pluto return may bring something big that concerns nuclear power it is definitely a possibility looking at this chart and Pluto has been opposing Mercury in the eighth house for quite some time. And throughout this year, it's still really there right now. And Mercury in this chart does rule the 10th house of presidents. I believe the way that presidents are elected and the different types 